Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we will consider finite dimensional standard cyclic irreducible modules and then observe something about the highest weight. So, let us recall what we did earlier. So, for lambda in H star, we define the V of lambda to be the quotient of Verma module, Ej of lambda modulo M of lambda. So, where Ej of lambda is the Verma module, Ej of lambda is defined to be take Ug and then take left ideal generated by the following elements H minus lambda of H 1 where H comes from H and then X where X comes from N plus. So, now uh, what is M of lambda? M of lambda is the sum of all proper submodules, the sum of proper G submodules of Ej lambda. And we observed that this is the unique maximal, unique maximal G submodule. So, maximal always means it is proper, okay. we do not need to tell it is proper. So, then V of lambda is defined to be the unique uh, quotient, the irreducible quotient of uh, V lambda. So, this is the unique irreducible quotient of Ej of lambda. So, the now, so we make following observations. So, because Ej of lambda has some important properties, one can immediately see that uh, those properties can be carried to this V lambda. Because it is it easy to see that uh, quotient of any standard cyclic module is again standard cyclic module. So, in particularly V of lambda must be standard cyclic module. So, first observation this is V of lambda is standard cyclic module and this is also irreducible. Okay. And of course, it is generated by lambda. So, V of lambda is indeed generated by U n minus V lambda. So, now this is also span of some y beta power y beta 1 power r 1 etcetera y beta n power r n. So, we call this uh, quotient also v lambda there is no confusion. Okay. V lambda again is defined to be the cyclic generator. Okay. So, cyclic generator of v lambda. Again we use the same notation for Ej of lambda and there should not be any confusion. Okay, so, for R1, etc., Rn being non negative integers. So, now this tells you that uh, the weight of V lambda this is indeed contained in lambda minus Q plus. So, that is the most important thing. And if you take any, any weight space, okay, if you take any weight space, so that should have finite dimension for all weights of V lambda. So, these are all some important properties uh, that we have for standard cyclic modules. So, those properties should continue to hold here. Since V of lambda to begin with irreducible, so the maximal module that is contained in V lambda will be 0, okay, which is the proper unique module. So, now, uh, so we make uh, further uh, other further uh, observations for this uh, modules if they are when they are finite dimensional. Okay. So, let us start with V lambda, okay. start with lambda in H star and assume that suppose V lambda is finite dimensional module. Okay. So, basically it is a standard cyclic module, irreducible cyclic module and then which is also finite dimensional. Okay. This is the assumption that we have. Then we want to conclude something about the lambdas and the weights of V lambda and so on. The very first thing that we observe is that the lambda must be dominant. Okay. These are all the observation. So, observation 1, lambda must be dominant, which is same as saying 
lambda of h i is in z plus for all i from 1 to n. Okay. So, how do we prove this? The proof of this again follows from SL2 theory. So, for i in 1 to n, let us look at this copy of SI. So, the copy of SL2 inside G which is I, which is defined to be SI. So, which is nothing but the subalgebra generated by XI YI inside S, inside G which is isomorphic to SL2. This is this we know already. So, now what we do? We take this U SI module generated by V lambda which is inside V lambda. So, note that this is again SI module. So, now we are taking SI sub module generated by this V lambda the highest weight vector. So, note that V lambda we can also call it as highest weight vector because it has weight lambda and x kills all those V lambda okay? because x V lambda is 0 for all x in n plus and h V lambda is lambda of h V lambda. So, now what we know about this module? So, that is the important observation. Note that this is first of all finite dimensional. So, this is actually finite dimensional SI module. So, now look at the look at its uh, actually uh, the gen spanning set. It is not hard to prove this is indeed span of V lambda y i v lambda and so on y i power some s v lambda. Now, note that h i v lambda is given by lambda of h i v lambda and x i v lambda is 0. That means, this v lambda is indeed maximal vector in the sense of SL2 module. Okay. So, but we have already proved something if you take a maximal vector and then generated module out of it in the finite dimensional representation of SL2, it must be irreducible module and it is isomorphic to that irreducible model corresponding to the lambda of H. So, this is naturally isomorphic to V of lambda of H. This is something we already proved. So, using this observation, we can see that this S must be lambda of H. So, then from this, we can conclude that lambda of h i must be non-negative integer because that is being the maximal eigenvalue of h i okay, inside this irreducible module. And we can also see that this y i power lambda h i plus 1 v lambda that should be 0. And i is chosen to be some integer from 1 to n. So, and this is these two observation must be true for all i. Okay. So, in particularly this holds for all i 1 to n inside our model V lambda. Okay. So, if you take our V lambda to be finite dimensional, then we observe that lambda must be dominant that is the first observation. The second observation that we made this y i power lambda h i plus 1 v lambda is 0, second observation. Now, look at uh, the wild group element action, okay, the wild group action which is S n plus 1 on this weights of v lambda. So, recall if you take finite dimensional irreducible module of S n plus 1, we proved that the while group S n plus 1 acts on the weights of that and it also actually preserves the dimension of the weight spaces. Okay. This is something we already proved. So, we have to prove something similar here in this uh, setting as well okay, because this we are considering the abstract module. So, that is the observation 3. So, in this again we use the same proof using the SL2 theory proof. So, now start with some weight of this V lambda. Okay. So, then consider 
this USI module generated by VMU. Then look at this SL2 sub module or SI sub module again generated by VMU which is inside V lambda and this is also SI module. Okay. So, now what we can say about this module V dash. Okay. Observe this weights of V dash. Okay. The weights of V dash must be contained in mu plus m alpha i where m comes from integers. So, this can be proved using the PBW type basis of USI. So, note that USI being SI being isomorphic to SL2 and SI being 3 dimensional space this is indeed spanned by. So, C x i okay, let us use this uh, C y i C h i and then C x i. So, this is the basis for this uh, 3 dimensional subalgebra SI. Then if you look at U s i using the PBW theorem, we observe that this is indeed span of y i power something let us call it r 1 and then h i power something r 2 and then x i power something r 3 where r 1, r 2, r 3 they are all non-negative integers. Okay. So, then this tells you that from this P B W W type basis of U S I, U S I module generated by V mu, this is again obtained by span of. So, you take this typical P B W type basis element and then apply it on this V mu, then we get the spanning set. Okay. So, now it is not hard to see since the weight of this is mu. So, the weight of this vector is going to be, so I will leave it as exercise, this is something we have checked already. The weight of this y i r 1, okay, h i r 2, x i r 3 v mu, if it is non-zero, so then that is going to be exactly mu minus r 3 alpha i this h is not going to add anything that is r 2 times 0 minus sorry this is uh, mu plus because this corresponds to alpha i this corresponds to 0 this corresponds to minus alpha i. So, you will get r 3 alpha i plus r 2 0 and then minus r 1 alpha i. So, basically what it says that if you take this element y i r 1 h i r 2 x i r 3 v mu. So, this is going to lie inside. So, you look at this uh, weight space of this u s i of v mu. So, then this is going to be exactly mu plus r 3 minus r 1 alpha i. Okay. So, this will be the h weight, not even like we are computing h i weight, we are computing the h weight and we are saying that the h weight of v dash will be contained in this uh, mu plus m alpha i where m running over from over integers. Okay. So, in particularly what will happen to the h weight? So, the weight of v dash is contained in the translation of this mu plus z alpha i. So, if I compute for example, the typical mu plus m alpha i and then compute the h i eigen value, then that you have just evaluated h i. Then this is going to give you mu of h i plus twice m. Now, for various m, this mu of h i plus 2 m, they are all distinct. That forces that the weight spaces of this, okay. So, they all like, uh, so the weights of this are all distinct for various m. So, but this is going to be finite dimensional module, SL2 module. So, in particularly, we know that the h i eigenvalues of this V dash module will be symmetric. 
okay so this is so now i'm looking at the hi weight if i look at weight hi of v dash we know we know that this is same as minus weight hi of v dash as a sl2 representation if you consider hi weights which is hi eigen values there is a symmetric uh, for any finite dimensional representation so for v dash also we have the symmetry so now that tells you that so for example if m equal to 0 you are getting mu of hi so which is going to be the weight of v dash with respect to hi so then that forces that minus mu of hi also must be a weight of this uh, v dash so but what will corresponds to minus mu of hi among this mu of hi plus 2m and it is not hard to see that this is equal to minus mu of hi will imply that m equal to minus mu of hi okay sorry plus sorry minus mu of h so now if you if you think in terms of this h weight what it should correspond to mu plus m alpha i if you take and then what should be that so that is nothing but mu minus mu of h i alpha i so that is your corresponding weight so this is what corresponds to minus mu h i when you evaluate at h okay so that means this should be there inside the weight of v dash because for all other values of m you will not achieve this you will achieve only for this value m equal to mu of h i so it must be there inside so that means this is there inside your v of weight of v lambda so this analysis indeed says says that whenever mu is weight of v lambda then that implies si of mu which is mu minus mu h i alpha i is indeed weight of v lambda so this actually tells sn plus 1 acts on this weight of v lambda okay so that is something uh, very clear so not only that uh, again using sl2 representation theory we observe that whenever you have k as weight of this v dash then minus k is going to be weight of this v dash not only that the dimension of v dash k is same as the dimension of v dash minus k so this is true for all finite dimensional representation of sl2 so in particular it is true for v dash but again using the similar analysis you can see that so this space must be what so if i take k to be mu of h i so mu of h i can be both positive and negative okay it it can it, it's not necessarily positive this is just an integer but for any integer we know that whenever k is there minus k is there and then v k dash dimension should match with v minus k dash so since this holds for sl2 representation you can easily see that for k equal to mu of h i we have the dimension of v k dash is same as dimension of v mu okay so which is equal to dimension of v minus k dash which is same as the dimension of v si of mu okay so this things holds inside v dash so in particularly not only that sn plus 1 acts on the weight of v lambda and the action actually preserves the weight multiplicities so in particularly dimension of v mu is same as dimension of v sigma mu for all sigma in sn plus 1 that is because it is true for any si and si actually generates this sn plus 1 for 1 to n okay 
So, that is why this is true for all weights of V lambda. So, these observations uh, that one can make immediately for finite dimensional standard cyclic irreducible module. We already made this observation for uh, uh, finite dimensional irreducible representation, similar observation that we are making it here. So, now you can uh, actually uh, conclude the following, okay. In actually somewhat more stronger version is true, uh, but I will actually leave it as exercise uh, because it's more combinatorial result. But what one can observe immediately? So, observation 4. So, if I take the weights of V lambda, okay. So, we want we already told that S n plus 1 is going to act on this uh, weights of V lambda. But can we say using that anything about the weights of V lambda, one can immediately say that this is going to be a subset of all the orbits of dominant weights which are below lambda. So, you take the orbit s n plus 1 acting on mu, where mu must be smaller than lambda and then mu is also dominant. So, if I take all possible orbits, okay. so basically what is s n plus 1 dot mu, this is sigma mu, where sigma comes from s n plus 1. Okay. So, I am, I am actually taking all possible orbits of this uh, mu where mu is smaller than lambda with respect to the dominance order and mu comes from the dominant weight. Okay. So, note that, so this is indeed finite set. Okay. So, let us actually prove that, prove that in uh, as a separate note. Okay. Here is the lemma, so which will be used later. Okay. So, this lemma actually tells something about this set. So, this set is indeed finite. So, so that is what this lemma says. Okay. So, if I take this disjoint union S n plus 1 dot mu, mu is less than lambda, mu is comes from lambda plus. So, this is a finite set. Okay. So, how do you actually see this? So, note that uh, the each orbit is a finite set because S n plus 1 is a finite group, it has n plus 1 factorial elements. So, each one of these orbits, so they are all finite. So, once we prove that the number of dominant weights that lies below lambda that is finite, then that would imply that this set is finite. First of all, I want to actually emphasize that so, this is also indeed disjoint union of orbits. So, because there would not be any intersection between these two orbits. Okay. So, these observations let us make and then prove it because these things will be used later. So, this is indeed disjoint union, disjoint union of orbits. So, that means if you take two dominant weights which lie below lambda, so then they cannot be in the same orbit. Okay. So, that is equivalent to saying that this is indeed disjoint union of orbits. So, let us prove one by one. Okay. First, what I want to say, if I start with any mu inside lambda, okay, we, will, we can only focus on weights okay, coming from this uh, lambda. Okay, then I can I can actually say that there exist W and W. Okay, so W is S n plus one such that W mu is indeed dominant. Okay, this is the first thing. So this is actually a very simple exercise. You think in terms of the uh, epsilon a basis. You take mu to be a 1 epsilon 1 plus etcetera plus a n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1. Note that, okay. so this is dominant 
if and only if this AIs are in the decreasing order. So, that is actually is A1 greater than or equal to etcetera greater than or equal to A n plus 1. So, this is actually already we know. So, now if I start with some mu, okay, let us start with some mu, say mu equal to A1 epsilon 1 plus etcetera A n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1. So, this A i's may not be in the correct order. So, this A i's may not be in the correct order. Okay. So, then how do you make it in the correct order? Of course, you can choose a permutation and then permute this A i's and then write it in the decreasing order. Okay. So, choose w in S n plus 1 such that a w inverse of 1 is greater than or equal to greater than or equal to a w inverse of n plus 1. So, then it is clear that w mu is nothing but a w inverse of 1 epsilon 1 plus etcetera a w inverse of n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1 which is dominant. Okay. So, this is indeed easy observation. So, now what is the second observation? Suppose mu and mu dash both are dominant and mu dash is inside the orbit of mu, okay, then that would force that mu equal to mu dash. Okay. Indeed, we will prove something stronger. Suppose if you write mu dash equal to w mu, then that would imply that w equal to identity. And in particular, we have mu equal to mu dash. So, why this is true? Okay, let us write mu as some a 1 epsilon 1 plus etcetera plus a n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1. Similarly, write mu dash to be b 1 epsilon 1 plus etcetera plus b n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1. Because both of them are dominant or elements of lambda dash sorry lambda plus then that would force that a 1 is greater than or equal to etcetera greater than or equal to a n plus 1 and similarly b 1 is greater than or equal to etcetera greater than or equal to b n plus 1. So, now if you take w and then permute for example a i's then what will happen? If you take w mu so that is going to be a w inverse of 1 epsilon 1 plus etcetera plus a w inverse of n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1. So, you are permuting the AIs and you are claiming that still you are getting the decreasing sequence. Okay. That is not possible unless w is identity. Okay. Then this is you are saying that mu dash and you are saying that w inverse of 1 is again greater than or equal to greater than or equal to a w inverse of n plus 1. And of course, so here you are actually uh, kind of uh, saying that okay so one has to be little bit careful in in this argument so for example all the coefficients are equal so then you will be able to actually uh, say that uh, uh, this w is indeed uh, like can be taken to be any element of S n plus 1 and then it acts uh, on that trivially. Okay. So, it fixes that so that you are going to still get uh, uh, this uh, the permutation of that which is actually kind of satisfying this property. So, to avoid that triviality maybe uh, I will not claim this W being identity. Okay. But it is actually not hard to see even without this climb, okay, one can, one can uh, get what we wanted. As long as your mu dash is inside the orbit of mu, so then uh, and mu and mu dash both of them are dominant, then that will force that mu equal to mu dash. Okay, so, I will actually kind of leave it to you to think about it unless okay, the coefficients of, okay, so when you are actually trying to permute 
okay so if a i a j if they are not equal then when you are actually permute them if a i is greater than a j then the order is going to change okay so up to that kind of w's okay so only you will be able to act it on mu and then you can get another uh, dominant weight okay so that will force that so because this is true so this will force that mu dash is same as mu okay so i will leave it to you to convince yourself that there could be some non trivial w's still it it can be dominant there is no other option because this is being dominant so it has to be in the decreasing order and a1 etc a n plus 1 to begin with in the decreasing order so by permuting it you are again getting the decreasing order sequence so that will force that so so this is same as a1 and this is same as a n plus 1 okay so that something like uh, you can think about it uh, very carefully so now uh, this indeed proves that uh, if i start with some weight okay let's say below lambda so start a weight which is below lambda then there exists w in sn plus 1 such that w mu, mu being dominant so that means if i take uh, this set of all weights okay set of all mu in capital lambda so that mu less than lambda if i look at this set then this set can be written as union of the orbit sn plus 1 mu where mu is less than lambda and then mu comes from dominant okay this is obvious so now if you look at uh, two different orbits for different mu's okay so then they cannot intersect that is what the uh, our previous observation says so that means this must be disjoint union so now why this set is finite so it is enough to prove that okay to prove this set is finite it is enough to prove the mu lambda so mu is in lambda plus such that mu less than lambda this is a finite set okay and that can be actually obtained uh, very easily so look at what is the meaning of lambda greater than mu so that means lambda minus mu is summation ki alpha i where i range from 1 to n where k is all in z plus note that alpha i is nothing but epsilon i minus epsilon i plus 1 for i from 1 to n so now you write lambda in terms of the epsilon i basis a1 epsilon 1 plus etc an plus 1 epsilon n plus 1 and then write mu as again b1 epsilon 1 plus etc plus bn plus 1 epsilon n plus 1 note that a1 should be greater than or equal to greater than or equal to an plus 1 being dominant b1 should be greater than or equal to greater than or equal to bn plus 1 now let's do this calculation look at lambda in a product with lambda minus mu so this is going to be lambda comma summation ki alpha i i range from 1 to n then if you take it out summation lambda alpha i where k comes out where i range from 1 to n now note that lambda alpha i is going to be lambda epsilon i minus epsilon i plus 1 so this is exactly ai minus ai plus 1 which is non negative number so then that means this summation must be non negative number so similarly you can see that mu comma lambda minus mu again non negative number again mu being dominant so this force that lambda lambda is bigger than lambda mu which is bigger than mu mu okay because lambda mu same as mu mu lambda so that tells you that lambda lambda must be greater than or equal to mu mu okay so it is indeed telling you that when for those dominant weights mu in lambda plus mu less than lambda is contained in 
mu coming from capital lambda such that mu mu is smaller than lambda lambda okay so because we are actually if we take the real span of this alpha i and then because this capital lambda sits inside the real span of alpha i okay or you can also work in the real span of epsilon i so there you can see that using the standard inner product so this becomes inner product space so it's a euclidean space and this inner product is actually the standard inner product so basically you are saying that you are looking at the lattice elements which are bounded above by some particular norm so lambda is fixed okay it's a norm lambda square that is what on the right side so you are looking at the integral points that are actually bounded above the norm is bounded above by some constant and that must be finite using this uh, euclidean geometry so so that forces that this set is finite okay and one can actually give different proof using uh, by looking at the coefficients of alpha i and so on so so i will leave you to to think about it uh, actually so the choices of this k i uh, sorry the choices of this b i only will be finite okay because mu being dominant and mu is less than lambda will force that since this a is are all fixed okay in terms of a is you can actually get some bound for the b is and that will tell you that the choices of b1 etc bn plus 1 will be only finite so this way you can conclude that the or uh, the number of dominant weights which are smaller than lambda must be finite and that is telling you that this entire union is finite which tells you that those weights which are actually smaller than lambda so that set is already finite for lambda dominant okay so we will use this later in order to actually prove that if lambda is dominant then v of lambda must be finite dimensional even though we define this v of lambda in a more abstract way as a quotient of this standard universal standard cyclic module which is vero module so for dominant lambdas we can always get finite dimensional irreducible representation so that will be uh, our ultimate uh, result we will actually see the proof in the next class i will stop here thank you